What's going on, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. So today I'm excited to have author Zamil Akhtar joining me, uh, which you may know from Spiffbo fame so far, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But Zamil, how are you doing today? Good, man. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, yeah, it's uh, you gotta be you gotta be getting you know I guess a little bit excited. You know, you've already won the Spiffbo Seven cover contest. Yeah. I mean, that's it's pretty big, and now uh, you know we're you're still in the competition with your with your assigned judges, so I, I know that's going to be a little bit nerve wracking, a little bit anxiety ridden. But uh, you know, how how you feeling so far in, in the in the competition? Uh, it's it's definitely you know one of those things which uh, you're 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 like it's always in the back of your mind, you know, like what are you know? I'm sure like the judges, since I'm a semifinalist now, they're all kind of reading the book. Uh, over on, on the blog that I'm part of, uh, Fantasy Book Critic. Um, so I'm kind of, so it's always in the back of my mind, like what are they thinking? Do they like it? Um, you know, what about the other books? Uh, how good are they? And, and the other books are really good. So yeah, yeah it's, it's one of those things which, um, especially as a new author, it's kind of hard to, hard to ignore. And, and you know, it would probably be better if I just put it out of my mind, but uh, it's, it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah, it's probably it's probably it's easier said than done. Uh, I know yeah. I've spoken yeah. to a couple authors, and I'm like, so say how are you feeling? You it's spiffo. It's you know it's a big thing. It's a big deal. You got your name in with a bunch of other authors. Hey, they're like, oh, I've like completely let it go, but I've also checked Twitter and I checked the spiffo's page <laughs> like every thirty seconds. So <laughs> yeah, that that's pretty much how it is. It's like. When you see that notification on the Spiffbo page, you're like, "Oh my God, what's uh, what's going on over there?" And, you know, th I mean, there's 300 books, so it's usually not about yours. But uh, I'm I'm keeping pretty close track, and and it's it's fun to just be involved in it, uh, to talk with other authors. Um, I read like most of the reviews that get posted for all the books, just to see what other people are writing, and people are writing like the craziest, most creative stuff. Um, you know. So it's just awesome to to see that, um, yeah, and it's 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 great to have been a part of it and to win the cover contest especially was like uh, unbelievable. Uh, I almost didn't even go with that cover, so I'm just I'm glad I went with it and uh, yeah, I'm glad the judges liked it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. So so uh, was your alternate cover like completely different than that one? Yeah, it was it was very different. Uh, in fact, I launched with that cover, uh, and then like a week later, I changed it up. Um, basically, I did like a poll, and I saw that people preferred the current cover that I have now. Mm. And I switched it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm glad I did, and I think, of course, covers matter a lot to for books uh, to succeed, um, and I think the cover really. Uh, pushed people to check out like what the book is about so you know I'm, I'm really glad I went with that cover um and yeah I, I was I was honestly surprised that it won because there were so many amazing covers uh in the competition uh but I guess it was kind of unique in that it it was it was probably the big Cthulhu honestly <laughs> on the cover <laughs> that did it so I don't think anyone else had Cthulhu on there so yeah that, <laughs> yeah it's it's was, also uh, always interesting yeah it's also always you know really interesting to see like what covers people like uh because you get an idea in your mind of like oh people are gonna love this cover and they go in a completely different direction uh yeah. it, it just you know goes to show the taste and that's and that's what also makes this competition so interesting is that you know you've got 10 different blogs everybody you know there are some books that everybody agrees on and then there's a lot of books that you know, everybody's really hot and cold on uh and even within even within my blog the the 10 or we, we now have eight we've dwindled since the beginning we, we started out with like 14 you know we have eight because uh, everybody's like you know we've got like two having babies and everybody else has got like work stuff so um but everybody's like differed on uh mostly covers some content um but yeah, and then that's why kind of the, the why we went the way we're going, uh, which I know every blog is different. Some have just, you know, allotted, you know, five to 10 books for each reviewer. And we've decided just to comb through all of them. So that's kind of why we're taking a little bit longer to, to get, you know, answers out. I know we just did a, a cut of 10 yesterday. 
Um, but we're all given all the books a fair shot. You know, and, okay, do we like this? Are we all in agreement that this one needs to move on or if this, this one needs to be cut? Um, because you're going to find those couple where maybe you don't like something, but everybody else disagrees with you. <laughs> and yeah. I feel like that's the kind of the same way about book covers is that, man, I could love something that say like Richard Anderson did or uh, Tommy Arnold did. And the next person may want something that's like super simple and has like the, you know, a character staring away or something <laughs> instead of having like a bunch of action going on. But yeah, I, I'd be really interested to see your original covers. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm, I missed out on it, but uh, compared to what you've got now, but yeah, the, the one you've got now is phenomenal. It's very, you know, the, the, the color is very dark and you kind of get a feeling for what the book is going to be about. So I'm kind of, I'm, gl- I'm glad you went with that. And I'm sure you are now considering you won the contest. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that was, that was just a nice little um, early, you know, early success, I guess, in the competition. Absolutely. Um, you know, so yeah. um, <laughs> um, and I, I even with the with the next book, I continued the theme, like the, the cover theme of the first book um, with like the big monster. So I think it's just kind of, you know, uh, people, people like big monsters. Um, yeah, especially the love, the love craft ones. people like dragons, you know, uh, I think I think the key thing that I like to see in a cover is like one central element that just like because a lot of people see covers as tiny little thumbnails uh, mm-hmm. on like the Amazon buy page. So if there's like one really evocative central element on the cover, uh, I feel like that tends to work. Because even if it's like you see it really small, you'll still pick that up. Um, whereas some covers are just like so beautiful, but but they're they're also really detailed and they've got small details on them, and you don't always pick them up when they're like a tiny little thumbnail. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So that's like, you know, covers are just such a, it's such an important thing for writers, even though it's completely separate from the writing. So it's kind of, it's kind of a frustration. Uh, and when you, but when you get it right, it's, it's unbelievably helpful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and like you said, you know, the, the whole thing about details, you know, we, we do a lot of cover reveals on the blog. It's, it's been kind of, it's been something that I've really wanted to do for years and I'm glad we're starting to kind of pick up reveals. Um, but seeing, you know, people's initial reactions to book covers, it's not the, it's not the same reaction you're going to get by searching for something on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're going to get a lot of cover of the spirit uh, of vengeance. Cover. Oh my gosh. Oh, right. <laughs> Felix oh Ortiz, God, like, dude. my gosh, dude is amazing. Uh, it, it drives that, me crazy how good mind. it is. <laughs> but, Absolutely. like, you know, people can see that blown up on a screen or, you know, on their phone or something. But if you're just, like, scrolling through trying to find something to read, it may not catch it. Now, that yeah. one, kind of like what you said, though, has a central element. You know, you've got, yeah. you've got your main character right in the center of the book, and then you've got the dragons around it. But there are small little details that if you really want to picture it, you can see. But that's gonna be like one of those that ends up on a shelf anyway. Like it's just it's just too yeah. pretty not to. <laughs> Absolutely. But yeah, that. it's 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 really interesting. This the kind of the dynamics that you you kind of pick up when you do when you do covers. Yeah, that that cover, I think it had the best of both worlds. It's got the central element and the details. Um, I kind of want to get a poster of that. <laughs> I put it up on my wall. It's just too like pretty. I'll tell Rob he needs to do a Kickstarter that he that he does posters for. <laughs> <laughs> I think sh- I think I think his his covers, especially in that series, mm. um, they all would work as like posters. Yeah, they're all really cinematic. Um, even the Pond's Gambit one, uh, that one also I really liked. It was very. It, it's like it's just very cinematic, and it has this um, Akira Kurosawa kind of feel to it. You know, um, so yeah, I'm. I'm very impressed. <laughs> yeah, he, he needs it's it's so interesting too because you know Felix hasn't been doing covers for very long, but it's so cool seeing his progression from like when he first started to now. Um, and you can see the progression from Never Die to, to Spirits of Vengeance too. Oh. Um, the the oh, yeah. color schemes, like there's a lot more color and a lot more detail. Um, I mean, even I even look back at some of Michael Fletcher's uh uh, covers that he's done especially for his city of sacrifice series like from from book one to book two like there's just so much of a dramatic shift and just the way you know he does vivid imagery um but yeah i 
I, I love book covers so much. So <laughs> any, oh, yeah, anything that's eye catching, like I'm going to, I'm going to scream about. So, <laughs> um, so I kind of want to uh, just ask you, you know, tell me, tell me about yourself. Tell me, you know, about growing up. Did, did you read a lot growing up? Did you write a lot growing up? Uh, and then kind of when you decided to start writing seriously. Uh, when I was growing up, I didn't so much as read fantasy as I would play a lot of uh, video games. So I played like a lot of Final Fantasy, um, a lot of JRPGs, uh, and that really kind of made me fall in love with the whole idea of creating secondary worlds. So, um, and then after that, uh, I started to read more like typical fantasy, like Lord of the Rings, um, Harry Potter, um, you know, and other, other stuff you typically read uh, at a young age. Um, but then as I, as I grew up, uh, I kind of decided that, you know, I really wanted to create a fantasy world, um, which was more based on, I guess, my particular cultural background. Uh, so I come from the Middle East, so I kind of wanted to see like a fantasy world which, uh, you know, was based on that instead of based on, uh, you know, the, the, the more typical fantasy worlds based on Europe. So I actually wrote my first book. Uh, this was a long time ago when I was in college, uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, and it was you know, it was a pretty awesome experience. It was the first time I was really writing a novel. And, you know, I, I wrote, I created like this world based on um, Middle Eastern mythology, and it was just really fun. Um, and, you know, that really got me into, into writing novels. But then kind of uh, life took over and I, you know, I, I had to work, of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> had to actually get a job and I couldn't stay in college forever. So for a long time, I just had it in the back of my mind, you know, that like I should, I should write like another novel, a bit, you know, and take into account everything I learned writing my first novel. Mm. Um, and this was also the time when Game of Thrones was, was on, was, was on TV. And I, 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 you know, before the show ended, I read all the books as well. And I was really like, you know, amazed because I hadn't read fantasy in that kind of style. Um, I guess we would call it grim dark, or we would call it um, kind of more based on history. Uh, so that kind of is what inspired Gunmetal Gods. Uh, in that, I said to myself, you know, I want to kind of write Game of Thrones, but based on Middle Eastern history, because uh, the Middle East. Is Middle Eastern history is, is ripe for a story based on war and betrayal and all the things in Game of Thrones. Like, I think he, uh, GRM, he based it on um, English history and really famous, uh, really famous accounts that happened, like the War of the Roses and, and other such things. Uh, but in the Middle East, you have, you know, you have things like the Red Wedding and 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 that kind of stuff. You have it happening all over the place. So there was just so much inspiration I could draw from. Uh, so that's kind of what inspired me to start writing Gunmetal Gods. Um, and this was, I started writing it 10 years after my first novel. So it, there had been a very long gap. And between that time, I'd mostly just written horror short stories. So I was very into cosmic horror as well at the time. So I thought, you know, let me put a bit of Lovecraft in there. Let me let me put a bit of that in there to spice it up. Uh, and I think that the you know the combination of these elements, um, it it just it just worked somehow. Um, so I'm I'm really glad with how Gunmetal Gods turned out, and you know that it's kind of unique in that in that uh, combination uh, that that I created there. Yeah. Uh... So you said you said you you wrote a lot of uh, cosmic horror short stories. Who, who are some of your favorite uh, cosmic horror writers? I'm just curious. Uh, definitely, you know Lovecraft, Stephen King. Uh, there's also Jinjo Ito, who's uh, a Japanese uh, manga artist and writer. Uh, his cosmic horror stuff is 
it's very different from Lovecraft, but, uh, and I really recommend people, people check him out as well. Cause it's like, it's all about that dread, uh, you know, that, that like cosmic sense of dread that you feel as a tiny human being, uh, mm. basically. Uh, and then um, someone who I've recently started reading is Ken Liu, who wrote The Three-Body Problem, uh, which is mostly classified as a sci-fi story, but it's also cosmic horror. Uh, and some of his ideas have also really impressed me. I also read a lot of cosmic horror on the Reddit No Sleep community. Mm. So that's where, that's where I was writing my short stories. And I, I read a lot of short stories in there. And, you know, I don't remember the names of the writers, but there's so many good, like, really creative short stories on there. And I got a lot of my ideas from those. Um, and writing, writing on the Reddit No Sleep community actually gave me a lot of confidence uh, because some of my stories were really well received by people. So that kind of gave me confidence to write another novel. Um, so yeah, you know, it's cosmic horror. Um, I don't know why I love it. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, just a wee bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, you just, you just go with what you like, I guess. I gotcha. Yeah, I was curious if you'd read any like Peter Klein's or uh, John Owner Jacobs. Uh, there, there's some of the, I guess, the more recent uh, ones that I've read in Cosmic War. Um, and uh, and John Owner Jacobs, most of his is like short story stuff, uh, like the Sea Dreams in His Disguise. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> and I'll have, to, uh, I'll have to check that out. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think what his. I know his last one was called like Murder Ballads and Other Stories. Uh, gosh, what was the one that I read before that? Uh, a Lush and Seething Hill is is really really good. Um, it's got a lot of really good little story. It's two it's two big stories, but they're oh, just so good. Um, so yeah, I re recommend those if you if you enjoy cosmic horror for sure. Um, yeah, uh, you know it, it, it's so funny that you were talking about you know trying to write something that wasn't uh, you know the the medieval England, <laughs> uh, you know, fantasy, because, you know, I was just talking to Ian Green the other day. He said the exact same thing. He's like, I'm just, I'm tired of seeing the same stuff over and over again. And I feel, I feel that's kind of where we're, we're finally starting to get those new voices in fantasy and science fiction. It's, it's really telling those stories that we haven't seen before that we're, you know, we're not just constantly beating over the head with you know, the same stuff over and over again. Um, and it's really good to see. I'm really, really glad to see that there's, there's, there's more out there because we knew, it, we knew it was there. We just didn't know how to, you know, access it. So, um, so tell me a little bit about your, your writing process. So you said you, you know, you were writing a little bit in college, then you took a decade hiatus and then you got back to it. So how did, did you remember any of like those tools that you had when you first started writing, when you came back to writing, or did you kind of start from scratch and really find your way back into you know, how, how am I going to write this novel? How am I going to get this done? Yeah, it was tough. Um, because back, back when I was writing in college, I used to write exclusively in the third person. Uh, and then now I write in the first person. So actually it was, it was kind of like rediscovering how to write uh, completely. Uh, because I, you know, I, I, couldn't really rely on the skills that I'd gained 10 years ago. I think I, I mostly forgot a lot of that stuff. Mm. Uh, so for me, but I think, I think just inherently in my mind, I was always, I was always telling stories, even though I wasn't writing them down. So I was always dreaming up worlds. I was always, um, you know, imagining things. And, and whenever I'd watch, whenever I'd read something or watch a movie, I'd always pick up on, you know, the kind of devices that, were being used and, and the different strategies that writers uh, would employ. So my mind was, even though I wasn't actively writing, my mind was still kind of uh, chewing on ideas and, and such. So actually when I sat down to write Gunmetal Gods, um, I had like, I think I had, I just had a lot of ideas pent up and they all just kind of flowed. And I wrote the first draft uh, in like 30 days. Wow. Um, and, but the challenge was to, to make it, to actually make it good, <laughs> to make it like, to, to make it not, you know, to make the words uh, flow and sound nice and all You mean that, it didn't right? come so, out perfectly? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but so the editing actually took like over, it took me over a year to edit and i think during that period where i was editing it that's when i actually relearned how to write because that's when i you know I, I i you know hired a professional editor um to help me out and i you know during my revisions i would try to you, you know just just fix my writing and, and get it good uh and this this actually really helped me um actually feel confident in my writing so much so that when i wrote the second book that one only took me two months to edit uh, because i was much more you know i was using all the skills that i i gained uh for during this long process with gunmetal gods uh so you know even though there was that 10 year gap i think my i always wanted to write and i always wanted to be a storyteller and that kind of never left me Hmm. I gotcha. Uh, as far as as far as publishing Gunmetal Gods, was were you always going to go the self publishing route, or did you did you attempt the the trade waters and just decide to to go the pub the self pub route? I'm just curious. I, I know a lot of authors that do go that route want more control over you know how their book sells, whether they can do you know promotional deals and so forth on it. Is is that kind of the, why you chose to do that to that way? I was I was. Actually, when I started writing it, I was intending to go the traditional route. Um, but when I started to write the query letter, that's when I realized that it was going to be a very frustrating process because, mm. you know, for even 10 years ago when I wrote my first book, I researched what the process was for getting a book traditionally published. And 10 years later, it hadn't changed. It was the exact same process where you email a query letter to, you know, as many agents as you can, and you wait months for them to get back to you. Um, and looking at what self-published authors were achieving, it just seemed like an added burden that wasn't necessary, mm. you know, in order to get readers and to have people reading your book. You know, there are so many self-published authors were hitting the top 10, you know, in the Kindle charts. So, you know, I, I, I at that point, I kind of switched my, my, you know, path and said, I'm going to do it self-published. I'm not going to burden myself with this whole query process. Um, I'm just going to do it. And it was, it was, a, it presented its own set of challenges in that, you had to produce the actual book and get the cover done and write, write the blurb and, and all of that. But um, it was all in my control. You know, I wasn't waiting for someone else to open my query two months later and then reply to me. So I like that sense of control. Um, and I'm very happy that, you know, now it's been 10 months since I published Gunmetal Gods. I'm very happy because I'm, I think, if I had gone the traditional route right now, I'd still be waiting, you know, for something to happen. Mm. And then I wouldn't have written the second book and I wouldn't be writing the third book and planning more books. You know, I'd still be waiting. So just that, that sense of motivation that, you know, this whole process has given me, um, you know, was absolutely worth it. And I'm very happy I went to self-publishing now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause what, what you're saying is that they need to have more agents out there is what you're saying. <laughs> no, uh, that would help, uh, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I feel a lot more authors are kind of going that self herb route just because you do have the control. You do, you do it on your own timeline. Uh, you know, I know, I know you got to wait for cover art to come back and so forth, but you know, that's really that and edits are really the only things that you're waiting on. You're not waiting on the publisher to get the schedule out and you're not having to do like a year of promotion where they may send arcs out and then your book finally gets published and they may or may not promote it at that point in time. And I see that as, as one of the, the small issues is that a lot of authors have to rely on themselves, even in the traditional role, to promote their own books because the publisher may have another book that's published in the same day or the next week or a week before that they're really, really pushing because that's the money maker, And the other ones just kind of fall by the wayside, which is really unfortunate. But then again, if you're self-pubbing, you're pretty much promoting yourself and hoping that readers will promote you and, and you know, blogs will promote you and so forth. So 
it's 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 difficult on both ends but i think having your own your own control over it the ability to enter things like spiffbo the ability to run promotions on kindle you know ebooks sometimes i know you can run promotions on physical copies as well uh so you know i can imagine that you and it's also a little more personal uh being able to like so, you know, so you sell your books and you're seeing this, you know, how many you're selling and you're seeing how many reads you're getting and pages read and Kindle Unlimited and, and all that stuff. So, you know, it, it I'm sure at some point it, you, you really start to kind of feel the love, uh, you know, depending on how your sales are going. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting ride. I think that I would probably go the self, the self club route, um, just because, you know, that, I don't know the the whole like querying and being told no like I, like I worked in sales for many years and got tired of hearing no <laughs> so I'm kind of like yeah. burnt out from hearing no so I just was like you know what I'm just gonna say yes and then I'll let the readers say no if they don't like it <laughs> yeah I think you know that's I've, I've heard this sentiment from like so many other self-published authors that uh there's there's also you know there's just an, an, an impatience, especially among, you know, like our generation, like to wait for anything doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, it's like, there's, right. you know, there's no concept anymore of waiting, right? So uh, it's just like, why do I have to so wait? My daughter. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, so, and then um, definitely, uh, you know, having, having the control and, being able to produce the whole thing yourself. Um, and, you know, when, when you reach a point where you do have readers, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like, you know, the, the moment I realized that people actually want to read what I'm writing, um, you know, that's, that makes all the difference. Uh, because like when I wrote that book way back in college, I did actually put it up on uh, Kindle and stuff uh, just you know, I didn't, I didn't try too hard, but I put it up there and like no one read it. So it was just like, you know, this self-published thing doesn't work. And it's like, you know, why bother with it? And, um, but when you actually, you know, do it seriously and you follow the best practices and you produce it as good as a traditionally published book would be, you know, you look at it, you, you look at it, you know, I, and I think self-published books now some of them are just at a higher standard uh, to some extent. Like some of the stuff I've read from, you know, certain authors, uh, it's, it's, it's frankly better than a lot of the traditionally published stuff I've read recently. So, you know, uh, when you do it seriously, there's no reason, um, there, there's always luck and there's always other factors that are beyond your control. But, you know, I think you can get readers and, when you do, it's, it's just amazing. It's, yeah. um, it's incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's plenty of self-published authors that are killing it. Uh, and yeah. you, you may have never even heard of them, but yet they're, they're doing so well because they've gained a readership and their readership continues to go along with them. And you've got others that are smart, you know, starting small indie presses that are just producing book after book, after book, after book. And it's just, it's, it's insane. And, you know, traditional publishers can keep up with that uh yeah. and yeah it's you know it's, it's, it's kind of like striking gold sometimes even in a traditional uh, you can have a book that sounds amazing and you've got several readers that love it but whether or not it's going to hit at the right time for the right readers and get word of mouth just going nuts you know you, you you just never know and a lot of times it it really helps when you've got you know the names that people are more familiar with to kind of to kind of get the word out you know, the, as an example, um, The Last House on Needless Street by Catriona Ward. Uh, had I not seen all of the early praise, because it, luckily it got launched in the UK first. So we were seeing all the stuff, you know, all the blurb, like Stephen King and Joe Hill and uh, Rio Ewers and a lot of other authors that are all coming out and going, oh my gosh, this book's so good. And then before like it even got like an announcement in the US, like Andy Serkis started picking it up for like a, a, a series and stuff. It's just like, oh my gosh, it's so crazy. But like she had two other books published before that book. Um, and if you didn't go and like search and search and search and find it, you may not have, have realized that. But now that this book has gotten so big, now readers will go read her other stuff. So 
it, you know, even if your first book doesn't make it huge like you want it to, or, you know, some people expect it to, uh, you know, if you ever, you know, down the line, if, if one book just starts killing it, you've got all those readers that'll go back and start reading your earlier stuff, or at least you'll have a reader from that point forward, uh, which is always, which is always really cool. So, but yeah, it's, it's a numbers game and it's really interesting, but you know, everybody I've spoken to that has done the self pub route has, they slowly realized that, you know, it's so balanced out with traditional publishing. publishing. I mean, you, the covers are all just as good, if not better editing you, there's plenty of editors out there that are freelance that'll, that'll, that'll do you really well. Uh, you know, just even, not even just the covers, but like the, just the feel of the books and the fact yeah. that people are doing the, uh, I, I like to call them nude hardcovers. I forget the actual term for it, but uh, you know, you take the cover off and it looks just as good as the cover. You're like Dragon Mage, for example, by, by ML Spencer. Um, but yeah, and, and the writing is just there. Uh, that's why, you know, we do the Spitbow contest. The, there are so many good writers that, that deserve to have their name bigger than, than they are. And this competition helps to really highlight those. Uh, so yeah, it's, I don't see it going away. I see it getting bigger. I see probably more authors turning that way. I know a ton will still go the traditional route. A ton still do because there's books being pushed every single day. But, um, you know, I don't think self-publishing is going to go anywhere. Uh, I think it's, it's just going to get even better. I don't know how it will, but it will. (laughs) Um, so, so tell me, uh, tell me about Gunmetal Gods. What is it about, uh, what, what were your you know, inspirations behind it? What influenced you to write the story? Uh, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so, so Gunmetal Gods, um, it's about two men who are caught in a civilizational war. Uh, they're on opposite sides of this war and they are basically motivated to fight each other um, and they're fighting over control uh, of, a, of a particular city, basically. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the story goes into, it, it follows these two men in alternating chapters. And it goes uh, pretty deep into their motivations, into the personal losses that they've suffered, um, and, you know, into their goals and into their morality and and it just examines this conflict uh, from these two sides. And it was based on basically the Crusades. So in the Crusades, you had two sides that were fighting each other and it was kind of a zero sum game. You know, They wanted control of this one holy city and one side was gonna win or the other side was gonna win. Uh, so I kind of wanted to take this idea and to really examine it um, from the perspectives of people on the opposite sides but I didn't want to do it as a historical novel. I wanted to do it as a fantasy in a secondary world with magic, with Lovecraftian monsters, um, you know, with all kinds of cool stuff and all kinds of uh, myths and gins and, you know, all kinds of fantastical stuff. Uh, And, uh, but, but at its heart, it is a story that kind of examines sort of the cycle of violence and really the futility of that violence and how it doesn't really get anyone anywhere uh, in the end. Um, so it's, it's it, you know, I wrote this, it, it's kind of a heavy story uh, in that sense, um, you know, but I also, I also wanted it to be, you know, something fun, something exciting. So there's action, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of humorous moments. There's a lot of levity uh, in the story. Um, and yeah, in, inspiration wise, you know, I, you know, like I already mentioned, at the time I started writing, uh, writing the novel, uh, you know, this was around the time when I was finishing up the Game of Thrones books, or, or rather the ones that have been released uh, as of yet. Um, and I was just really, um, I just really wanted to do this in a Middle Eastern setting. And, you know, to just show, uh, kind of to just show, you know, the, the richness in Middle Eastern history and in kind of, uh, you know, to kind of paint a picture of what the medieval Middle East was like and how people lived and uh, the kind of ideas that they had and, you know, and, and, and to meld this, you know, with a fantastical secondary world. 
Um, so, you know, it was, uh, it, it, it was something that I wrote. I kind of wrote it purely for myself. Uh, you know, it was, it was something that, you know, just reflected my own interests. And when I started writing it, I wasn't thinking too much of who else would read it. Um, so, you know, I'm very happy that other people, you know, ended up reading it uh, at the end. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think it, it turned out uh, pretty unique because of that. Um, and, you know, one thing is, you know, we were talking about self-publishing and, and I think one of the trends when the pandemic started was that people kind of wanted more lighthearted, fun books. So it kind of came out at the wrong time, <laughs> you know, and that it was, it was like kind of a bleak, very grim, dark, heavy book. Uh, so, you know, but I'm, I'm still glad people read it. It came out in October, 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but I didn't know, I didn't know this would happen when I started writing it. So, right, right. Yeah. You, you didn't like intend to do it, you know, <laughs> I didn't intend purpose. to depress anyone right, to make right. anyone sad, but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Cause you know, I did, I did hear that a lot that people were looking for lighthearted stuff. And honestly, like my, except for like not reading as much, my reading like taste didn't really change. Um, but like what I viewed ended up changing. Like I ended up watching like a lot of, and I hate to say this, but like I ended up watching a lot of stuff where like people kind of like spiral. <laughs> ah. Started watching a lot of reality TV. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I even hate to admit like watching reality TV because it's it's not something I normally would do. But like my wife and I would just like sit there and watch, uh, gosh, what shows were we watching? Oh, like uh, Married at First Sight. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. Uh, but yeah, uh, like, you know, yeah, you know, the, you know the, they, they get married, they're all happy, they go on their honeymoon, so, so it starts to get a little rocky, you know, and then they get back and it just like goes completely downhill. And it's <laughs> so good. It makes you just feel so good. You know, and that's probably why I <laughs> like watching it so much because, you know, we're just sitting at home. We don't want to go out. If we have to go out, we're masked up. If we have to go out, you know, we're like Lysol and everything. And yeah, but but if you if you're at home and you're chilling, you're like, all right, what can I watch to make me feel good? And that's that's pretty much what it is. Watching everybody else have a worse time than you do. <laughs> <laughs> that that makes sense actually. That, that, yeah. uh, I don't I, I don't know people, what it was, but like it just it just worked. <laughs> yeah, people people kind of react in in different ways. You know, some people want like something that matches their mood or matches the tone of the of the time. You know. Yeah. And so they, they, they might seek something more dark uh, or, or as dark as, as the time that they're living in. Other people just want to like escape that, and you know, need some levity. And then, you know, I mean, if you want to watch people spiral, go on their downward spirals, you know, more power to you. <laughs> whatever, yeah, you know, whatever, you know, gets you, whatever, whatever gets you, you to about, survive, right? I guess. Yeah. Yeah, whatever, whatever works. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, I mean, I still read a lot of fantasy uh, last year because, um, I mean, there, there were still great books being published and so forth. But, yeah, I just I felt like you know, I watched more than I read uh, because I feel like my attention span really, really went in decline last year. Because um, even even when I was watching those shows, like I still my attention was still in other things. Like I was still, unfortunately, scrolling social media or yeah. I may I may like be reading while something's on. Um and I'm hoping that my, my span comes back. Like, I, I hope I don't just have this, you know, five to 10 minute attention span for the rest of my life. Cause it's, it's so depressing. Cause I, like I already see my daughter, you know, they say your attention span is like what one minute for each year. So she's, she's, she's one now. I don't even think she gets to a minute before she's onto something else, but like mine, like, I think I'm like, I'm in a good, like 10 or 15 minutes. And I start to kind of like look around. I'm like, why can't I'm enjoying what I'm doing? Why can't I just keep doing this? <laughs> like my brain just doesn't work that way anymore. Uh, and no, I think I think the like, pandemic had something to do with it for sure. Yeah, it's like you know, I, I remember a time when I could sit and just watch a movie, but now when I sit and watch a movie, I'm grabbing my phone. You know, I'm like, and it's like, why do I need? two why do i need two different things to stimulate me at once why can't i just have one you know so it's like maybe we have too many devices i know maybe yeah. it's, it's just like too much too many screens 
I'm like, one is not enough now. Even right now, I have two screens. I have two oh, models. yeah, I do, I do too. Like, but I, I have three screens for work. So, I mean, yeah, I, there I, you go. I, and, I, and I have to have it. I mean, I can't get my job done. If, or, yeah. I can. It just takes like three times as long. So, um, no, you know, I figured out the solution to it, though. If, if, you, if you enjoy watching, say, like Netflix or Amazon or Hulu or whatever, whatever you watch, um, and, but you also like looking at your phone, just watch the show on your phone. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> so that's what I do. I, I just, I sit in bed and I just watch it on my phone. I'm like, I'm already doing the thing that I want to do. And this means that I can't look at anything else while I'm doing it. So like, I, I was like sitting in bed the other day, uh, I'm rewatching this, uh, the Dexter series. Cause there's a new season coming nice. out in the fall. And uh, I told my that's wife, awesome. I was like, all right, so I'm going to, I'm just going to go right rewatch it. Cause she didn't want to watch it. I don't know why but she, she doesn't want to watch it. So, so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to take my phone. I'm not going to scroll social media. I'm just, I'm just actually going to watch. And I actually, it actually kept my attention the entire time. One, because I just love that show. And Michael C. Hall is amazing. But also because I had like no other need to do anything. So it's not like I could like play on my Switch and watch a movie. So. <laughs> That's one of the shows that keeps your attention too. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, I've already watched. I think I've seen it through three or four times already. But yeah, I, just, I've seen I love it. it so much. I've seen it like four four times at least that's <laughs> um, i'm very look, much looking forward to that yeah Just, yeah yeah and uh you know you mentioned game of thrones like i wish i wish we had a show that was like is encapsulating as that show you know everybody tuned yeah. in for the new episode yeah. everybody was looking forward to the next season uh but there's just like not that i'm, I'm wondering if will of time is going to be that way you know will the new lord of the rings series be that way uh, you know, you've, I know Dune's just a movie, but I'm sure that'll get people's attention. Uh, I, th- I know there's, um, shoot, what's the, what's the one based off the, it's going to be on Apple TV foundation. Is that right? Oh, uh, the foundation show. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, by, yeah. By Asimov. Uh, I think that one, yeah. that one, may, that one could be. This is just one of those big overarching shows. Uh, you know, I know The Witcher to an extent had that kind of following um, and Loki and stuff like that, but they just don't last. You know, there's only six yeah, episodes. Yeah. You know, it, it's not a, a full, you know, big season that everybody expects. Um, but yeah, I just, nothing, I, I miss that kind of thing. Nothing has, has reached that level yet. Uh-uh. I think bef- before Game of Thrones, there was the show Lost. Yeah. I feel like that had that, level of hype because you know it was like a, a water cooler show it's like oh did you see last night yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like um so you know i think something has to come along eventually uh but it's, it's hard to predict no one no one would have said oh game of thrones is gonna be the next lost you know i, I never heard anyone say that when, when like people were like hey there's this cool show you should check out it's kind of cool it's called game of thrones like okay I'll, I'll check it out, you know. It was like season one, and you know, I was hooked from the first episode. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they 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 hit it out of the park uh, early on, uh, but it's it's hard to predict, you know. It's it's tough to predict what what that show is going to be. I guess. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like absolutely. Has to strike. Yeah, I mean, it's like uh, I know a lot of people were talking about Ted Lasso because the new season came out. Like nobody, I don't feel talked about it in season one, and then season two came out, and everybody's like, it's still just as great as season one. I'm like, where was that for season one? <laughs> but again, I didn't pick up Game of Thrones till season four, but I binged like the first four seasons in like a week. So yeah. uh, clearly, I enjoyed it. Uh, but yeah, there's just know, there's just nothing out there that I'm like, okay, I I have to watch this. This is the only thing that I'm going to be doing today. You know, I, I'm going to set aside reading and everything. It, I just go, I'll watch an episode or two and I'll go on to the next thing. Um, but yeah, like the, nothing's really captured my attention like that. Did. Um, I, I, I haven't just sat there on the couch, you know, and yeah. been the only reason I'm getting up is for the bathroom or the fridge. You know, <laughs> yep. there, there hasn't been that type of bingeable thing. So, yeah. All right. Who knows? May, may, maybe, that. maybe it'll come around this year, but. I also feel like the water cooler talk show has kind of ended because of the pandemic because nobody was going into the office oh, yeah. and having those conversations. Yeah. So maybe it's, it's maybe tough to have that. Yeah. This it's, it's hard to have that on Zoom calls because you've actually got to yeah. be business. <laughs> no, yeah, no, nobody's about, nobody's like, going. Who's ready for the second season of The Witcher? You know, on a on a freaking telephone yeah. call. <laughs> no, it's it's not the same. 
Um, all right, so we talked about Gumball Gods. Uh, tell me a little bit about what to expect in book two, uh, Conqueror's Blood. Uh, so Conqueror's Blood actually features mostly a new cast of characters, and it takes place in a neighboring country uh, to the country of the first uh, book. So it's when you start reading the novel, uh, you will probably find it to be like a completely new story. But as the story progresses, um, characters from the first book will emerge and they'll become very important to the plot. And readers will kind of see how the two books connect and you know how, how it's continuing the story of the first book. Uh, so I, I kind of wrote it, uh, I had very different ideas or, you know, I had, I had like kind of ideas that didn't completely connect with the first book when I started writing it um, because I wanted to tell sort of a new story. So in the first book, we had two characters who are on opposite sides um, in a kind of war, whereas in Conqueror's Blood, you have two characters who are living in the same palace together and they're friends and you know, sort of what ends up taking place is there's just a whole lot of palace intrigue and they kind of end up on opposite sides, even though they were friends before. Um, and, you know, that's kind of as far as where I'll go, but it just kind of, it, it kind of, um, it, it's, it's a very different process to the first novel, but it's in the same spirit where we'll see these two characters who are on opposite sides. They both have full justifications for why they're doing what they're doing. Um, they both have to make terrible decisions in order to succeed, in order to win. Um, and, you know, it really, it, the things that they have to do really test who they are. Um, so I think it's a more, it's a more nuanced story. Um, but for me, I feel like it's the best novel I've ever written. Like, I feel like it's better than gunmetal gods. And I feel like it, you know, by the end, by the end of the story, I think readers who enjoyed the first one are really going to love it as well. Uh, so, you know, I'm so far, it's been really well received. And I'm, you know, really happy about that, especially since I took some risks of changing up the setting, changing up the characters. Um, in fact, in, in this novel, they're both uh, female point of view characters. So mm. the dynamic is very different. You know, they're not they're not trying to like, you know, fight each other in, in sword battles and such. You know, they have a different way uh, whereby they oppose each other. Uh, so it's it's just a more it, it's sort of a more subtle story. There's less action, um, but I think it's a richer story. And I think it's it's. Um, you know, I really love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have to ask, uh, you know, going through Gunmetal Gods, uh, you know, you write a lot of fast paced uh, conversations. Your prose is very fast paced. Your, your fights are fast paced. I mean, everything is just, oh, oh you know, trying to catch your breath. You know, did you find it hard to keep up that pace while writing? I think that's that's actually my normal pace. Really, and I I had to slow. It, yeah, I I I actually had to slow it down, um, considerably because my my pace is just, you know, in my mind, I, you know, it, it goes back to that attention span thing. You know, even when I'm writing, I, I need to like I need to entertain myself by having some something crazy happen every page. Uh, you know, otherwise I, I, you know, that just makes the writing more fun for me. So when I went into the second draft, I realized, okay, I got to slow this thing way down. And even though I slowed it down, it still ended up really, really fast paced. Because this is the one thing everyone says is that it's very fast paced. And some people do like that. Whereas for other people, it's kind of overwhelming how fast the pace is. But it, it's actually... You know, I actually tried to slow it down. Mm -hmm. uh, with the second novel, I tried to slow it down even more. Um, but people still said it was fast-paced. 
So <laughs> just can't please everybody. <laughs> uh, so it, it's tough. It's 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 tough for me to do. Uh, but I think it is it is slower than Gunmetal Gods um, to an extent. Uh, but it's still fast paced. It's still like, you know, every chapter is going to move the story forward considerably. Every, ch every chapter is going to end, you know, with something that is going to make you want to keep reading. And so it, it still has that kind of uh, page turner um, feel to it. Hmm. Yeah. So, so I, I guess I'll never see Zamil Akhtar and then in a review slow burn fantasy <laughs> uh you never know you know you never know i might i might i might pull it up one day i know right you'll, you'll do a novella that's a slow burn <laughs> yeah i mean you know it, it could happen uh, but it's it's yeah it's tough for me to um i, I even when i read i do find that I prefer faster paced stories. Um, I think, I think it's, you know, it's, it's just my, my attention span. It's not, you know, my attention span just needs, needs something to be delivered more, probably more often than the average reader. Yeah. Uh, so I do tend to prefer faster paced stories, but I do really love, I've, I love, there are slice of life novels that I love as well. Um, you know, I love being immersed in like a setting. So that's also something with, with both my books, I try to focus on a lot is just setting details and bringing the world to life. And this is something I love also when I read it's, that's also why I like it. You know, I, I like the, the Song of Ice and Fire novels because he does take, he does describe food for pages and he describes mm -hmm. like clothes for pages. I, I actually like that a lot. Um, yeah. You know, I, I like how he describes, like, he'll describe, like, a castle for, for pages as well. You know, it just, to me, that interests me. So in, in my own novels, even though they are fast-paced, when, when I do go in, especially in the second draft, and try to slow them down, for me, it's all about, like, inserting all kinds of setting detail and bringing, you know, just bringing the world to life. Yeah. Yeah, I love description. And I, and I think, you know, kind of like you said, your, your writing started off with, 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 with video games. Uh, yeah. because I, I feel like my attention span for video games is, is insane because like I could just sit there and just waste hours. Uh, like I'm going back through and playing like the original Bioshock. I'm playing Diablo. I'm playing Super Mario. Like I, I love exploring. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I can do that when I read too. And when, when authors get it right, I'm, I, you know, I will go from start to finish in a day. Uh, but but yeah, I don't know something something about the written word. If I if I can't immerse myself in a character or immerse myself in a setting, I find it really hard to not just like kind of drift off like and and want to do something else. And it's not necessarily that I'm not enjoying the book. It's just that like it's not it's not holding my attention to the point where nothing else matters. Uh, yeah, and 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 sometimes it happens with, with audiobooks too. Uh, I honestly like a slow burn more on audio than I do reading it versus you know a fast paced like i almost feel like i have to read a fast paced book versus listen to it because i and, and i hate slowing audiobooks down so i'm always at like two two and a half uh on, on uh. listening speed so like i just like zoom through them so slow burns like actually end up being like an average burn <laughs> so nice that's a good that's yeah. a good strategy yeah yeah and, i mean it helps me get through books i mean i i try to get through as many as i can in a year not you know, I'm not trying to like really reach a goal, but like I've got to somehow get through all the freaking books that I have. It, it, there's no other way I'm going to do it. So like if I don't retain everything, luckily I'm probably not going to, you know, have to have reviewed that book at some point. So, but for the, for the ones that I do, I, I try to slow it down a little bit so I can really get the details right, you know, get what the author is, is attempting to portray correctly. Um, so yeah, so speaking of that, um, so I'm listening to, to Peter Noble's, uh, audio for, for gunmetal. Is he also going to be doing Conqueror's Blood? Um, I think so. I have to get confirmation on that. Uh, I'm not too knowledgeable about audiobooks, Um, but I, like I mentioned the, in the, in the second novel, we have, uh, the, 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 all the most of the characters, oh, the characters are being female. That the makes point sense. of view yeah. is female. So 
I'll have to see what uh, Podium, the publisher, are going to do. Um, Peter Noble did an incredible job. I, I, I honestly was in tears listening to his, um, listening to the audiobook because it was like a movie for me. You know, it was like, it, it's the next best thing to a movie. You know, like my, my parents are always like, when is the movie coming out? And, you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, but the, but the audiobook was the next best thing. And it was, he did a great job, you know, and it was, it, it was very immersive for me. Yeah, Peter's fantastic. Um, so I hope I hope he does. I hope he does the second book. I think um, he'd do a great job. Uh, but like I said, I'm not that knowledgeable on audiobooks, and I I haven't heard yet from Podium. So I guess let's see what what they say. Yeah, it, it would make sense to change it up for book two, or if he would, or if he'd have like an extended cast, I guess he, he could read some of the other parts. Uh, and, and then come back to, to book three if you decide to go back to a male point of view or if you have, you know, one of each. Um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see if he, if he could pull off two, two female protagonists in book two. But yeah, he, he did a phenomenal job or he is doing a phenomenal job uh, the way I'm through it. Um, so I know he did a lot of Christian Cameron's uh, earlier novels. Um, and so I'd, he I'd heard his, his voice on those and he's, he just like he kills it. I love audiobooks, like especially like when you really find that narrator that's like your your cup of tea. Like I'm like I'm big on like Colin Mace and Joe Jameson. They do like a lot of orbit audiobooks. Uh and so like anytime their names are just like, okay, gonna grab that one. Uh, I've got that one on the list. We're we're good to go on there. So yeah, I mean, I even if like my attention spans out there, like I know with their voices, I can, you know, I can really pick up where I'm where I'm lost at. So um, so you said you're working on book three now. Uh can you can you spill any beans on it or is it still too early so right now i'm working on a uh novella uh so it'll it'll also be sent set in the gunmetal gods universe uh so i want to i want to write a novella basically to give my news uh, newsletter readers something uh for free um so i'm working on this it's not going to be too long since it's a novella um, and I'm also at the same time working on book three. Uh, but since I've been working on the novella, I've kind of put book three a little bit to the side. So it's still in its very early stages. Um, but it's, I'll say that it's going to merge the, the cast of book one and book two together in a more cohesive way. So I think there are people so far from what I've seen of the reception of book two, there are people who absolutely love it. Um, they think it's superior to book one and they, you know, they love the characters, they love everything. Um, and there are also people who kind of miss uh, some the characters from book one. Uh, they miss the more, the more action and war oriented story. So, so I think book three will, will and I think people who read book two will see how the ending is set up for this to happen. But book mm -hmm. three will, will kind of merge the two uh, character casts together and it will kind of set, it, it'll, it'll kind of involve a, a larger conflict more similar to book one. Uh, so I think it'll please fans of both books. Um, and, you know, I won't say any more. I won't say like who are the, point of view character is going to be or, or anything about the plot but I think um, you know writing especially when you have an audience now like before I didn't have an audience but now I kind of do have people who who have expectations for what the next book is going to be about so it's more it, it, I feel like it's it can't be too much of a selfish process mm -hmm. uh, so I take feedback into account and but at the same time I want to write something that you know, I'm going to love. So I think, you know, book three is, it's really going to be cool. And I think people are going to like it. I see you're really, you're really going to kind of strike a balance between your happiness and your reader's happiness. <laughs> I want people to, to enjoy it. I want everyone yeah. to like it. There you go. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm also going to like it too. So there you so, go. So, there you <laughs> go. Um, so last question I got for you, what, uh, what are some books that you've read recently that you'd recommend? Uh, so recently I was, I've been making my way through the, uh, three body problem book series. 
Uh, so I mentioned this earlier when I was talking about cosmic horror, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm a big sci-fi fan uh, as well. Uh, and I, I really enjoy, I really just love how this series kind of, you know, just the ideas that it has. Um, and it's, it's written by a Chinese author. Uh, so it's, it kind of takes Chinese history and a lot of ideas from Chinese history and, and casts it into this incredible sci-fi story. I think a lot of people have read the book, but they haven't read the subsequent books in the series, uh, mm -hmm. but they're really good. Um, I'm also reading, uh, um, I've been reading a lot of, a lot more indie books. Um, I've been reading, uh, Nora Liska Groans. Mm. I think you've read this one, right? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've been reading that one. Uh, I think because it's going to be my competitor in Spiffbo. <laughs> so <laughs> I want, I kind of, and I've heard good things about it, uh, from, from, you know, so I've, I've been reading that one. I've, I've, and I've really been, been enjoying it. I read, I've read Michael Fletcher. Uh, I read his his novel that was in the previous Spitbo. Um, and Blackstone I Heart. enjoyed that one. Yeah, Blackstone yeah. Heart. I read that one. Uh, I enjoyed that one, but I'm liking this one more. Um, yeah. Because I like the, I think the setting is just so cool. You know, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, what, what you imagine Russia to be, you know, yeah. just it's just crazy uh, so I'm, I'm enjoying i'm enjoying the setting in that one um i actually i tend to read a lot of books uh a lot of books at once so i'm, I'm also reading dragon mage uh which is another you know book that every that everyone uh says to read and I, i'm enjoying it um i mean it, i mean it's a tome it, it's 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 a it's a it, tome yeah. you, you really you get a bunch of big boy pants on to read that one it takes a little yeah, while absolutely but it's, it's uh it's taking, really good <laughs> it's taking a while um, yeah yeah and i i think she's just like a uh you just feel like you're in good hands when you're reading it because it's like you know you feel like this writer knows what she's doing yeah um so you know that's 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 been enjoyable um yeah, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm also reading uh, a one, one more book I'll mention, Artifact Space. It's another mm. one. Uh, that, that's another sci-fi book. Um, I do like my hard sci-fi, so this is, this is like really hard sci-fi. It's like really detailed in how it describes like the starships and stuff. So mm. uh, that, that's one I'm enjoying. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, I'm constantly just like, downloading books like on kindle unlimited and opening them and reading a few chapters and you know so whatever like whatever that's the attention span thing is whatever is like i love kindle unlimited because it's just like i can just keep trying all the books and whatever keeps me involved i'll just keep reading it so you know, yeah yeah that's how it goes uh, i guess i understand yeah artifact space is yeah you like you said it's really detailed yeah i mean just just the whole like landing process is yeah. like so fine tuned, and and Christian asked me about that. I, I interviewed him. Uh, I guess about a month ago, maybe about a month and a half ago. And he asked me, he "Was like, all right, what did you think of that?" And I go, "Oh, I loved it. I loved the detail because I mean, he, it was like two or three pages of like just landing." And I'm like, "Please yeah. give me more," because <laughs> uh, because you know, he he mentioned that he was like, "Gosh, I really, I really hope they never see this." But he's like, "You know, in the expanse, like they just like can like land." Like, like it's no big deal there's all these spaceships all around but just it's no problem just to like go into port <laughs> he's like I, I didn't want to do that i was like i want to explain how freaking difficult it is to like get it right and not like be off by you know an inch so yeah i i, I freaking love i devoured that book and yeah norio school groans it's really interesting because i think this is the first time that fletcher has actually co-written it uh, you know, co-written a book with somebody else. Yeah. So I like the way that him and Clayton really play off each other in that book because um, they both write a different character in it. So uh, yeah, I can't, it, I can't tell who's. I, I actually don't know who's writing which character because it, it felt very like, you know, I think they did a good job of making it feel cohesive. You know? Yeah, it feels very At seamless. Me, yeah, I and, I, and I can't yeah. remember who wrote which one. I'll have to, I'll have to go back and and ask Mike. But yeah, it, I, I read. Gosh, I read that one back in October, November of last year. Um, because I Mike Mike sends me like early copies of all these books because we've been we've been pals for years now. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I remember reading that and I was like, so who wrote who? Because like it feels like Fletcher wrote this entire book because <laughs> I'm well, so used to his I, writing read, style. I've read River of Thieves by Clayton Snyder, and I can see I can see in Norlist of Groans uh, his humor in there. Yeah, like he has this absurd humor, um, very very hardcore humor, I would say. Yeah, um, and it fits the setting perfectly because I think you know they like. Uh, you know, our our idea of, I guess, you know, Tsarist Russia is like that. It was just this hardcore, ridiculous place where, you know, people smashed vodka and, you know, and it's just it's just perfect for for Clayton Snyder's humor, I think. Yeah. Um, and and you can see, uh, I guess, you know, the two of them combined. Uh, it, there was some like magic, magic that happened there. I think. Uh, so yeah. I'm very worried. I'm very worried about this book. <laughs> taking, <laughs> taking gunmetal gods out. So but, you know, if it happens, it's well, it's well deserved. Uh, there you go. Were, I haven't finished it yet, but I'm enjoying it. I, they did a good job. Absolutely. I gotcha. Well, cool. Well, uh, Zamil, I, I really appreciate you coming on and chatting. Uh, and best of luck with gunmetal gods and Smithbo. Uh, I, I know you're you're gonna do well in it. I'm sorry that you have height competition, <laughs> but you know, I, I have a good feeling about it. Um, and, uh, and, and everybody, so gunmetal gods is out, uh, in all formats. Uh, it just came out uh, on audible not too long ago. So you can go grab it an audiobook. Uh, conqueror's blood is also out, uh, and paperback and Kindle. Uh, and I guess, is it in hardback yet? Or is it coming out in hardback? Yep. Yep. So it's out in hardback as well. So, Go grab yourself some copy. Uh, check out Zamil's newsletter for his upcoming novella. Um, and Zamil, just seriously, best of luck in Spiffbo. And uh, we'll do this again sometime. You too, David. Thank you for having me. It's great. Absolutely. Thank you.